All right, so we've talked about how the, the shorter way to find valence electrons. So yesterday we draw, drew it, and we found that the ones that were on the outer um, energy level are our valence electrons. But there's a shorter way to find it, and that is based on the elements what? Group number. Yes, the group number, which is a column or a row. A column. Yes, a column. All right, and for groups... 13 through 18, what do we have to do? Subtract. Yes, so for 13 through 18, we have to subtract 10. So in group one, how many valence electrons? One. One. Group two? Two. Group 13? Three. Three. Group 14? Four. 15? Five. 16? Seven. Seven. Eight. All right, thank you there. Beat you. All right, so we are going to be using electron dot structures today, so I wanted to make sure and go over that and make sure that we're all good. Sorry that that's right in your seat. It's fine. All right, so we're going to be using those electron dot structures. So I wanted to make sure that we remember how to draw those, okay? So I'm going to go through a different group, all right, or a different period. Last time we went through period two on the periodic table. This time let's go through period three. All right, so electron dot structures, remember, they represent the number of valence electrons using dots. All right, so I'm gonna start with sodium. So sodium is in group one, it has one valence electron. So there's four spots you can put them, top, bottom, left, or right. It doesn't really matter where you put it, you just put one dot. All right, so next element is magnesium in period three. So um, here, it's in group two, it has two valence electrons. So we have to put them on different sides. Doesn't matter which two sides. Typically you can do like top, right, bottom, left and keep going in that order. But as long as you don't put them together, that's fine. So the rule is you have to have one on each side before you start to double any of them. All right, so now we jump over to group 13 and our element is aluminum. So it has three valence electrons. So we would put one on three different sides. All right, then we move over to group 14, and we have silicone. And silicone would have four valence electrons, so one dot on each side. All right, now we get to group 15, and we have phosphorus, and it has five valence electrons. So we would have one on each side, but now we can double one of them. So I'm gonna double the top. And that's called a lone pair, a pair of electrons. We like those, those are stable. Um, so those are happy. We like lone pairs. In fact, if we had four lone pairs, our atom would be stable. So we like lone pairs. These are lone electrons. These are what causes our atom to be unstable, so it needs a mate. And that's where our chemical bonding is going to happen, is at these lone electrons. All right, moving right along, we have sulfur in group 16. It has six valence electrons, so we have one on each side, and then we double two of them. So we have two lone pairs. Group 17 over there, we have chlorine with seven valence electrons. So one on each side, and now we can double three of them. So three lone pairs. And then group 18, we have argon with eight valence electrons. So it has four lone pairs. So all the elements up here want to be like which one? Argon. 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 They all want to be like the noble gas here because it has eight valence electrons. It's following the octet rule. It's stable. All right, so the charges come into play. All right, so it takes the same amount of energy to lose an electron as it does to gain an electron. And um, atoms are just like people. They want to do things easiest way possible. So to get to eight, sodium. It has one valence electron in its outer energy level. So to get to eight, it can either gain seven or it could lose that one outer one where that energy level drops off and the next one has eight. So which is easier, losing one or gaining seven? Losing one, losing one which is why all elements in group one have what charge? Plus one. What, what charge? Plus one. Plus one because they're going to gain or lose one electron threw me off over here. All right, here, magnesium, which would be easier, lose these outer two or gain six. 
lose two, which is why they're plus two. They all lose their outer two. Here, lose three or gain five. Lose three, which is why these are all plus three. Which would be easier here, lose four or gain four? Either one. Either one. It would be the same amount of energy, right? So that's why this group is plus or minus four. Either way, they could get to eight. All right, going over here, gain three or lose five? Gain three. Gain three. So this group is negative three. They're going to gain three. Here, gain two or lose six, which is easier. Gain two, so they're negative two. And gain one or lose seven? Gain one. Do they need to do anything? No. No, which is why they have no charge. So that's how the charges come into play with these atoms with how many valence electrons they want to gain or lose to get to eight. Okay? You remember talking about that? Yes. All right, so that is the last bit of review. Now we move on to new. All right. So now get out a clean sheet of paper. And I don't think we need to do this slide. I think we're good here. All right, so title this, Chemical Bonding, Chapter 6. Chemical Bonding, Chapter 6. This is your first brand new set of notes for Kim B. Everything else so far has been some review. chapter six vocab right now but chapter six um i think mia emailed me it was you yesterday right that told me that the book the part that i'd uploaded i think my file is too large so it won't download so i'm going to try and upload it into two different documents today or pdfs so i'll try and do that whenever i get a chance probably next period i should have a chance to do that um but i will have the textbook uploaded in case you want to you know besides vocab you want to read it you feel free you know all right, so there's three types of chemical bonds. The first type is ionic. The second type is covalent. And the third type is metallic. So ionic, covalent, and metallic. Now we're really only gonna focus on the first two types, ionic and covalent. There's just not really much to do with metallic um, but the way to differentiate between the three two or the three types is based on what is bonding together. All right, so what do you think bonds together in a metallic bond? Metals. Metals. So here, this is metals bonding. All right. Well, wh what did we learn that ions are? Atoms. Atoms with a what? Charge. charge. So we have positive charges and negative charges. All right, well, well, our positive charges are over here. And what types of elements are these? Metals or non-metals? Metals. And our negative charges are over here. What types of charges or elements are they? Non-metals. So an ionic bond is going to be between opposites, a metal and non-metal. We're going to have a positive ion and a negative ion. So... In looking at those combinations, and don't include metalloids, okay? Because hopefully you remember that metalloids are just elements that can have properties of metals or nonmetals. It's not like a brand new species of something, okay? It's just elements that can have properties of both. They either act like a metal sometimes or they act like a nonmetal. It's not something different, okay? So we have metals, metal and nonmetal. So what do you think the combination of covalent is? And please don't say metalloid. Just non-metals. <laughs> non-metals. All right, so that's how we differentiate between the types of bonding. is based on what is bonding together. So like I said, we're really not going to focus on this type because if you put metals together, does anyone know what you get? No. Well, you do get more metal. <laughs> alloy, yes, good Kyle, you get an alloy. 
Well, that's not how you spell owly. Got a little too fancy there with my cursive. An alloy. And alloys are just like percentages of elements put together, like stainless steel is an alloy. They're homogeneous mixtures. So we really don't have much to do. In all the co like college chem classes I took, I really don't remember doing much with metals except for in inorganic chemistry, looking at those structures of them. So we're not going to do much with this. So we're going to focus on these two types, okay? Specifically, <coughs> this one right now. All right. So, ionic bonding, just write ionic bonding. We'll go through this slow because I got lots to talk about. So, ionic bonding. That's what we're going to focus on right now. Maybe before, like next week, we'll get to covalent, like maybe Tuesday, maybe Monday. But we definitely won't test before Thanksgiving. It'll be the week after Thanksgiving. So ionic bonding. So there's three ways that I could word this on the test. It's a bond between, well, what did we just write? It's between what two things? Yeah, yeah. metal and non-metal. Oh my goodness, I can't write today. Metal. Metal and non-metal. All right, but what charge do we say are the metals? Positive. <coughs> So these are our positive ions. And what are our negative or our non-metals? Negative. Yes, negative ions. So I could also word it that it's a bond between positive and negative ions. I could also use the fancy names for those. And what is that? Cation. Yep. Cation and anion. So three different ways I could word that on the test. What is a bond between a metal and non-metal? What is a bond between a positive and negative ion? Or what is a bond between a cation and anion? All three of those mean the exact same thing. All right, so we know that bonding is between electrons. Specifically, which electrons? Valence electrons. So what's happening in this type of bond? Well, you have positive ions, and what do they want to do with their electrons? Do they want to lose them or gain them? Lose, right? They want to lose electrons. They want to give them away. And then you have these negative ions that want to do what? Give. They want to gain them. So what do you think is going to happen when they bond together? They're going to transfer them, right? The positive ion is going to give its electrons away, and the negative ion is going to gain them. It's a perfect exchange of electrons. So this is a transfer of electrons. It can also be called a loss and gain of electrons. And the reasoning is because we have our metals that are very um, not electronegative. They really want to lose their electrons. And you have these nonmetals that have a high electronegativity. They really have a strong attraction towards electrons. So whenever you get them in close proximity, they're going to want to exchange those electrons. And that's how they chemically bond. All right, so we have opposites here. And what do opposites do? They attract. So do you think this is a strong or weak bond? Strong, strong yeah, because opposites attract. So there's actually an attraction between these atoms because um, they're opposites. So this is the strongest type of bond strongest type of bond. All right, so when you melt and boil something, all right, you're breaking apart that bond. So if this is a really strong bond, do you think it would take a lot of heat to break it? Yeah, so do you think it has a high or low melting and boiling point? High. All right, now even though we're putting ions together and ions individually have charges, when we put them together, we're gonna have to balance them out to where our overall compound is electrically neutral. So at the end, we should not have any charges left over. So we're putting things together, ions that have charges, but overall our compound will end up being neutral. So an example of an ionic compound is table salt. 
So what's the name of table salt? Sodium chloride, and sodium is a metal with a positive charge. Chlorine is a nonmetal with a negative charge, so that's an ionic compound. Do you agree that table salt at room temperature is a crystalline solid? Yeah, yeah it's a crystal. All right, so most ionic compounds are crystalline solids at room temperature. Most are crystalline solids at room temperature. So ionic compounds, when dissolved in water, they break apart into their ions. So if you have ions, ions can conduct a current. And I'll show you that tomorrow with a demonstration. So when dissolved in water, ionic compounds can conduct an electric current. So those are all the properties of ionic compounds. together. All right, so what we're going to be doing and what you're doing for your assignment today is the two-step process of ionic bonding. Two-step process. So the whole purpose of this is to figure out how atoms will chemically bond at the molecular level. All right, so what would be their chemical formula when they bond together? All right, so our first example here is potassium and iodine. <coughs> potassium, iodine. All right, so the first step, the first step. All right, we're going to draw our electron dot structures. So draw electron dot structures. All right, so I have potassium. What's potassium symbol? It's not P, yes, K. All right, and potassium is in what group? Group one, so how many valence electrons does it have? One, so it has one dot. And I'm gonna add that to iodine. And what group is iodine in? 17. 17, so how many valence electrons? Seven. seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's the first step. I just draw my electron dot structures of the two elements that I have. Now I'm gonna show my transfer of electrons. So, show transfer of electrons. All right, so here, what's potassium going to do? Is it going to gain seven or lose its one? Lose its one. What's iodine going to do? Gain one. So here, this electron is going to come over and bond where? Is it going to bond here? No. No, it's going to come and mate with this one right there. So I'm just going to draw an arrow to right there because that's where it's going to go. So I showed my transfer of electron. There's only one transfer here. So did my potassium lose its one outer one? Yes. So does that mean that there's none left? Yes. No. No, because no, all that happened was that outer energy level now dropped off and the next one is filled with eight. All right, and did iodine gain one and does it now have eight? Yes. yes, so always check and make sure you've got your eights. Now, how many K 
atoms letters did I use? One. Just one, right? How many I atoms letters did I use? One. I letters, not dots. One. one, right? So now I'm going to write my chemical formula. Yes, this is where we're doing that. So this is step two, because this is our two-step process, right? So there's step one, step two. So I have K subscript one, I subscript one, because I use both of them. Now, when I write a chemical formula, if I only have one of them, do I need to write a one subscript? No. No, because just writing the letter indicates that I have at least one of them. Now, if I have multiple, like two or three, I need to put a two or three. So I could just write this as K. Any questions about that one? Tried to start simple, one and one. Good? <coughs> All right, let's get a little bit more challenging. All right, so potassium and oxygen. Potassium and oxygen. So we know potassium has how many valence electrons? One. One, but now we're adding it to oxygen. And oxygen is in what group? 16, so how many valence electrons does it have? Six. six. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we know potassium wants to lose this one, and that's all it has to lose. So this one can come over here. But am I done? No, no because oxygen needs another. So what do I do? Add another potassium. Yes, I'm going to have to add another potassium. So I pretend like I have a beaker and I've got potassium and oxygen atoms floating around. So I can keep adding more of both, but that's all I can add. All right, so I want to know how will they bond at the smallest level so I can keep adding more of each atom. So I'm going to add another K atom, and it still has one valence electron. So this one can come up and bond right there. So now, did both of my Ks lose their one outer valence electron? Mm -hmm. Yes. And did oxygen gain the two that it needs? Yes. yes. So am I done with this step? Yes. Yeah, always check and make sure that your metals have lost their outer ones and your non-metal has gained to where it has a total of eight. So now, how many Ks did I use this time? Two. Two. So K subscript two. And how many oxygens? One. One. So my chemical formula between potassium and oxygen would be K2O. Potassium oxide. I make up every practice problem y'all get. Because I started teaching pre-teacher pay teachers, like pre-Google, so all my worksheets are made up. So they're probably, I don't even know if we have potassium oxide in the lab. Any questions on that, though? All right. Okay, go ahead and end the video.